factors that contribute to undue hardship. The EEOC has some clear guidelines on this. Um, again, it's the nature of the employer's workplace, the type of job that's needing to be accommodated, the cost of the accommodation, the willingness of other employees to assist, the possibility of transfer, um, and what impact that has on the employee. So it could be an internal transfer within a building or to a different building, um, but you know it may be you know, um, it may have an undue burden to all sorts of folks. What is done by similarly situated employers and the number of employees available for accommodation and the burden of the accommodation on the union, if there's a union involved in that particular case. So these are all the factors that the EEOC considers when they're balancing out what is considered to be an undue hardship. So if you're a small organization, something could be an undue hardship to you as compared to being a behemoth like AB InBev or you know, Monsanto or Bayer or, you know, Boeing or, you know, any large major um, employer in the area. In the end, the courts are going to find undue hardship if an employer must violate the seniority provision of a collective bargaining agreement um, and they force other employees who do not wish to do so to trade places with the employee who has a religious conflict. So what it comes down to is if you're saying to your employees, well, you have to do this because I have to accommodate this person, that's considered an undue hardship. You can't force an employer to make somebody else do the work. Someone has to be, has to volunteer, has to be willing to do it. Um, you can ask them. If they refuse, then you've made your, your, you've made your reasonable accommodation, um, and that becomes now an undue hardship. Title VII does permit religion to be a bona fide occupational qualification. Remember, sex is or gender is greatly limited and race is not allowed um, as a bona fide occupational qualification, but religion can be. It must be reasonably necessary for the employer's particular normal business operations. Um, so somebody who's a receptionist who may, you know, need to answer questions about religious elements um, in a religion you know in an organization maybe they can but a other um, uh, other positions may not require it um, for example somebody who's an accountant I mean an accountant is an accountant regardless of religious beliefs and of course anybody can do accounting work so that you might be able to argue that you know accounting is not does not need a BFOQ but other positions might, where they might come in contact with the public, right? Specifically, uh, the law specifically permits educational institutions to employ those of a particular religion if they are owned in whole or in substantial part by a particular religion. So the, the Loyola University of Chicago is, is, is Catholic, and so it can make certain requirements of people who want to work there if they want to, to say that you need to be Catholic to be able to do that. Religious harassment is probably the most active area of religious discrimination right now. There are two types. There's uh, harassment based on hostility towards belief, beliefs. Um, so the traditional you know, perspective in that I have beliefs and I'm being treated differently because of my beliefs. And there's also harassment based on religious activism. For example, someone who's proselytizing or evangelizing about a faith in an organization creating an undue, an undue um, um, an untoward event, an, an atmosphere, or harassing uh, atmosphere um, for somebody who doesn't share those religious beliefs. So under the EEOC guidelines for federal employees, they should be permitted to engage in rel private religious expression in their personal work areas. They should be permitted to engage in religious expression with fellow employees with reasonable restrictions. For example, you know, if Christians want to have a prayer before a meeting, they can meet at five minutes before and they can have a, a, their prayer then and then people can come in at the, at the anointed time for the meeting um, without feeling like they need to experience a prayer in the workplace if that's something that they're not comfortable with. They are permitted to engage in religious expression directed at fellow employees, um, but cease when it's requested or unwelcome. So when someone says, please stop, that's when it becomes harassment. To have somebody express a religious practice towards somebody is not the problem in and of itself. It's when it's repeated, like sexual harassment, when it's repeatedly done, 
when the person explicitly says this is an unwelcome attention, it's unwelcome action towards me. So to avoid liability, the employer must make sure their policies protect employees from those religious employees who attempt to proselytize and who do not wish to be approached by religious matters. It should protect employees with permissible religious practices from being, a hard time, being given a hard time by others. And we want to make sure that the employees are given comparable opportunities to use workplace time and resources for religious practices. So if we're going to have a Christmas party, we may also want to make sure that we accommodate other faith traditions who wish to have similar expressions of their faith in the workplace. We can't say we'll only allow Christian practices and not Muslim practices or Hindu practices or anything along that line. So if you're going to make the if you're going to allow for practice for practices. Right. You want to make sure it's allowed equally for everybody and, and that allowance is across the board for everyone who chooses to practice. Along with employers, unions are also under a duty to reasonably accommodate religious conflicts. So there may be some religious beliefs emerging regarding union dues, union membership, um, engagement in certain activities such as picketing and striking. So the religious religions may uh, not require, uh, may, may um, sorry, may, may inhibit someone from engaging in union dues or union membership for any particular reason. I'm not sure where that would fall, but I mean, certainly um, it is within the realm of possibilities, obviously, as you can see from the, from the Hardison case. So um, it is important that unions are also held to the same standards and that they don't um, they have to make um, ac uh, accommodations, reasonable accommodations for religious conflicts, as long as it doesn't interfere with um, seniority, things like that. Employees have objected to the payment of union dues as a form of violating their right to the freedom of religion and prohibition against religious discrimination. So again, for some, the argument is that unions interfere with their ability to um, to practice their faith, in which case then um, they don't have to belong to the union uh, for that reason. It does violate Title VII for an employer to discharge an employee for a refusal to join the union because of his or her religious beliefs. Um, and that's the Thule versus Martin Marietta case. So this chapter has a wide variety of management tips. There's actually three slides of them. Number one, we want to take all employees' notices of religious conflict seriously. Like any, any form of discrimination and religion is not included, take the complaints seriously. Investigate them appropriately as if they have merit. And then if you determine they don't have merit, that's a separate issue. But it is important that we investigate and take all of them seriously. Once an employee puts the employer on notice of a religious conflict, immediately Try to find ways to avoid the conflict. Through that iterative negotiated process, we're trying to figure out whether or not there are, you know, there's a way to through this so we can resolve the conflict. Ask the employee with the conflict for suggestions on avoiding the conflict. So we can figure out, okay, if we have a conflict here, what do you recommend? I can't have you not do something, but we can what can we do to accommodate whatever the, the conflict is? We want to ask other employees if they can be of assistance in alleviating the conflict. Again, we can voluntarily ask them, but we cannot require them to do it. That would be a, that would be considered an undue hardship to require them to do it. We want to keep religious workplace religious comments and criticisms to a minimum. Again, when we're in our in our in our workplace, we're not criticizing any particular faith tradition. We're not con we're, or practices. Um, it is not our job to conflict to to criticize that to question what someone chooses to behave how they choose to behave how they what they choose to believe in, um, but um, it doesn't mean that it, that that religion necessarily gets free reign and being able to treat others poorly either. So we have to be very careful of that line that we're not going to we're not going to engage in religious discussions and we're expected to sort of minimize that because it's not the nature of the job right is to be talking about religion. Make sure all employees understand they are not to discriminate in any way against employees on the basis of religion. Once an employee expresses conflict based on religion, do not challenge the employee's religious beliefs, although it is permissible to make sure of the conflict. So 
again, the, the point isn't to challenge the religious belief, but to verify that there is indeed a conflict. And you can say, oh, I see you say this is against your religion. Explain to me how this is against your religion so I can understand that. And if it is, if this is a conflict with your own practices, then we'll figure out how to make the resolution. So we can ask that question, but we're not there to say, I don't believe that that is, but we can ask for the clarity to understand the history and, the, and behind it and why it is considered a prohibition so that we can then make the accommodation as need be. We want to revisit things like Christmas bonuses or Christmas parties or Christmas turkeys and use holiday, right, as an, as an, as an exchange. Um, Again, um, if we're going to have celebrations of Christmas, there's nothing wrong with having a celebration of Christmas at work as long as we allow a celebration of Hanukkah or Passover or Diwali or Ramadan. We're going to honor all the holidays. And so if we're going to use holiday language, if we're going to use, I mean, if we're going to use religious language like Christmas bonuses or um, you know, Christmas celebrations or things like that, let's make sure everybody's religion gets to be expressed. Otherwise, we try to change it to a more neutral term that allows, you know, a wider variety of practices and a larger umbrella by calling it just a holiday party or a holiday event or what have you. Um, thinking about giving religious leave, most organizations in the United States follow a Christian bias in terms of the holidays that they give off the, to allow that them to have off. So for example, people don't uniformly get um, Passover off or they don't get um, uh, you know uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur off. But for people who are Jewish, that is those are the important high holidays to the Jewish tradition. You know, contrary to popular belief, Hanukkah is such a minor holiday to the Jews it doesn't really matter. It's just, you know, it's not Christmas light. It's just a very minor holiday in the big picture of things. So when we are coming up with um, leave, um, it is important that we recognize that not everybody needs to have Christmas off, right? Because Jews don't celebrate Christmas. So maybe we have what we call floating holidays. So the organization might be closed for some major ones, but, but we still allow for minor holidays. So, you know, our, for, not minor holidays, for, for, for other holidays or floating holidays so that um, someone who is Jewish can have off for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which are very important holidays, you know, in the Jewish tradition. Lastly, make sure, number one, that undue hardship actually exists if it, if it is claimed. So you want to make sure you're very clear about, um, you know, where the hardship is, why it's a hardship, and follow those criteria that the EEOC set up. Next, we want to make sure food at the workplace events is inclusive of all our employees, regardless of religion. So, for example, we want to make sure that we've got kosher items or halal items for our Jews and Muslims, respectively, non-alcoholic beverages for those who don't drink, which includes Muslims, but also includes people who are Southern Baptist and things like that, and, and uh, people who are LDS, Latter-day Saints. We want, you know, we also have people who are vegan and vegetarian. Hindus are more likely to be vegan or vegetarian um, because they don't want to do harm to animals. So, um, so there's a wide variety of religious expressions and even non-religious expressions that require some food accommodations. How hard is it to make that accommodation? It's kind, it's, it's, it's appropriate, right? We want to ask employees about their religious dietary limitations or having employees bring a dish to share is an easy way to handle this. So it's like everybody brings a dish and we can share so we, everybody gets an opportunity to taste and learn about people, diff all the different um, national cultures and their different expressions of national culture through food. Um, I'm a food equals love kind of person, so <laughs> this always excites me. I'm like, oh, I get to try something new and fun. Um, it can have a real significant impact if we really truly make the difference in really allowing people to express their, their culinary treats. People take pride in this and they love sharing their traditions. Um, and that's, the, that's really our goal. Um, and when we allow people the expression of their traditions across the board, and it's not limited to anybody, then, you know, then it's a, then it's a good thing.